Hello, and welcome to the Common Good Project. This is the third conversation in our conversation series centered around the question, what is the common good? My name is Ryan Mead, and I'm the convener of the Common Good Project and this conversation series. I'm joined today with, by my co-convener, Chris Conway, who will introduce our guest in just a moment. Uh, before we go to introductions, I want to thank the Faculty of Law at Oxford, as well as Blackfriars Hall and the Aquinas Institute at Blackfriars for co-hosting this event. Our guest scholar today is Professor Thomas Pink, and he is subtitled the conversation, Natural Law and Why Do We Need a State? I think this is going to be a fascinating conversation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chris for introduction of Professor Pink. Our guest scholar today is Professor Thomas Pink. Tom Pink is Professor of Philosophy at King's College London. Professor Pink is widely known in the areas of political philosophy, ethics and philosophy of action, philosophy of mind, as well as being highly regarded as well as one of the leading scholars examining late medieval philosophy and the rise of early modern philosophy. Among his several books are The Philosophy of Freedom and Self-Determination, The Ethics of Action. He is the author of numerous chapters and articles, uh, as well as serving as editor of multiple collections of philosophical essays, and importantly, the editor of the widely used English primary source of Francisco Suarez's selection from three works. Professor Pink read history and philosophy at Cambridge. He was awarded a PhD at Cambridge in philosophy. Taking some time off from academics, but surely still immersed in observing the world, after finishing his postgraduate studies, he worked in banking in London and New York. He returned to academics in 1990 as a fellow of Churchill College, Cambridge, then taught at Sheffield University before arriving at King's in 1996. Professor Pink, welcome. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I want to talk about a certain very natural way of looking at the state that you get a lot of modern, modern treatments of it. It's a story about what states do and why we need them. So we all need to be protected from the ill will. We're vulnerable. And we're deeply dependent for the meeting of basic needs on cooperation with our fellows. And what the state does is basically facilitate all this. It restrains the ill will through sanctioned act law. And again, through laws, directive laws, it helps coordinate the cooperation we all need. And it basically does this centrally, so far as it imposes legal obligations, does other things as well. Um, through directives governing the voluntary, what we might do or refrain from doing on the basis of the decision to do it, perhaps as a means to conform into the law, like paying taxes at a certain rate, uh, parking our car in a certain place, refraining from taking goods belonging to another and so forth. And that's basically what the state is fundamentally about. It's acting as a protection and coordinator of device that serves each of our interests in a way that we can immediately understand and we can understand apart from any debatable metaphysics of the self um, or any debatable substantive moral theory. So we've got a way of thinking about the state that's neutral between competing moral theories to a fairly large extent and, and makes no metaphysical demands of any great sort. And Conceptions of the state that have it doing other things, particularly conceptions of the state that have it getting inside our heads, trying to regulate what we believe, for example, uh, seem inherently unjustified and possibly unfair, precisely because they're going beyond this modern, this, this, this function of coordinating and protecting. And if we wanted to say a little more about that, we might say something like make observation of wrong lines of Herbert Hart's view of, of sanction backed law as a fair choosing system where if the sanctions have been fairly imposed, they ought to apply to what we can do or refrain from doing on the basis of the decision to avoid the sanctions. Um, again, we come across the thought that this, all, this whole structure of directive law is governing the voluntary. This idea of the state is actually fairly modern. Um, it, I think, comes from Hobbes, from Thomas Hobbes, 
And this was Thomas Hobbes as confronting the very different, I think, way of looking at the state that we get in the early modern and, and medieval natural law tradition. And it's that confrontation that I want to say something about now. Um, behind all this is, 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 a, is a sort of interesting puzzle because Hobbes is not notably, I think, a liberal thinker in any interesting sense, but he's, he's developed a framework for thinking about the state that you get in a lot of modern liberalism, and that raises some interesting questions. Um, I mentioned Hobbes because if you, if you look at some, some container of received wisdom like the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and look up natural law or ethics, you'll suddenly see Hobbes turning up as not only a natural law ethics ethician or natural law ethical thinker, but a paradigm ethical law thinker, which I think is really quite weird. Um, that tells you that something very strange has happened to the modern literature and natural law, which you might come back to in discussion. Um, he's not a natural law thinker, he's an opponent of natural law theory. And um, one of the things that shows that he's not a natural law thinker is a central question that is raised by this modern model of the state. Um, and where natural law theory took a very different view from a lot of modern theorists, which is, how law directs us. In fact, there are two questions we've got to have in mind. One, how law directs us. And if it's directing us towards some common good, um, what must the common good be like for it direct, to direct us in this way? Um, Hobbes himself thought that, uh, I mean, if you remember Aquinas's conception of, of, of laws as an ordination of reason for the common good, that's part of the story at any rate. And certainly Hobbes thinks that legal directives are directives of reason in, in, in some sense, uh, aiming at a good that we all share. Uh, um, but um, the way that law directs in Hobbes's view and the way that law directs in the natural law tradition view are quite different. Um, let me say something a bit about that. When Aquinas uh, or a later thinker like Suarez, uh, whom Hobbes is immediately opposing, talk about law being an ordination of reason. They mean, they really mean this as a story about how law directs us. So these legal obligations that the state impose get us to conform to them as citizens of the state and to do what is legally obligatory. How do they do it? And the story about the ordination of reason is a story about how that happens. And it's a story that appeals to something about which I think a lot of modern political and legal theory is fairly silent. It's to do with the force or power of reason. What is reason? Reason is a sort of kind of normative standard. We can all see that. Um, we use reasonable as a term of approval of people and unreasonable as a term of criticism. But it's more than that. It's, it's normativity, kind of, sta a sort of standard that calls on us to meet it, to meet it that uh, is specifically directive. Reasons or justifications direct us and they address a capacity in us to respond to that direction. The capacity we think of as the capacity for rationality. We think a little more what, 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 about, about what that involves. Um, uh, what it immediately addresses is not what we've been talking about in terms of the modern model of, of the state and how the law directs so far, voluntary action, so moving our hands around or paying tax at a certain rate, but something prior to that that's going on in our heads. It's the formation of psychological states or attitudes um, and beliefs, desires, intentions. All these psychological states or attitudes are directed at objects of thought, potential objects of belief objects of decision, intention, desire, which come with justifications. In the case of truth, they're truth in the case of belief, they're truth-related justifications, uh, evidence of some sort. In the case of potential objects of motivational states like desire, decision, intention, they're, they, they, they come with a, their justification for relation to goodness. So that would be a good thing to do. So I start wanting to do it as I deliberate about it. And then I might decide to do it and intend to do it. And then eventually at the point of voluntary action, I might go out and do it by paying tax at a certain rate. So all these justifications immediately address us as bearers of psychological attitudes. And so on this natural law model of law, uh, law 
legal direction works in the following way. It may concern voluntary actions, like paying tax at a certain rate, uh, or refraining from theft, and that sort of thing. But our immediate response that it's immediately addressing is a response made at the point of our psychological attitudes, where we respond to justifications and uh, uh, form certain motivations or form certain beliefs about, about what we should do and, what, and intentions about what we're going to do. <clears throat> this force of reason is, 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 is a sort of force or, or capacity of justification to move us. It raises lots of metaphysical problems, uh, which I won't say anything more about immediately about, except to say that Hobbes didn't believe in it. He just didn't believe it existed. It's not part of Hobbesian nature, which is just a world of motions and matter producing further motions and matter through ordinary causation. Uh, so the only power or force in Hobbes's universe is ordinary causation of the sort that's involved in bricks hitting windows and breaking them and the like. Um, there's no force of reason that plays no role at all. So immediately we can see why he's not a natural law thinker as his opponents were. He's got a completely different story about how law directs us, one, one that doesn't involve reason as a force. Um, his story is something like this. Um, we all, or most of us, have built into us uh, or produced in us through ordinary causation some fundamental motivations, like a motivation to survive, a desire to survive, an appetite to survive. And this is a, this is a sort of material statement, but I won't go into that very much. But it's, it's, it's a bearer of ordinary causal force. And then the communication of the law coming from the state uh, engages with this motivation to survive or to reach some other good outcome. Uh, and uh, we decide to do, form a will to do what the state has asked us to do, required us to do, obligated us to do, as a means to surviving, basically, in the Hobbesian story, or to get to some other outcome. So the, communi legal, the, the, the communication coming from the state is just a, a causal happening, it interacts with another causal happening on my part, to get me to, for my motivation to, to survive, to uh, as a means to that, become motivated to do what the state has required me to do. And of course, all this is happening on the assumption that the state is governing or directing the voluntary, what I might do on the basis of the desire to survive as a means to surviving. And so we immediately see how the metaphysics of power is feeding in to a very distinctive story about how law directs and what it directs, which is voluntary action that might be subject to desires like desires to survive and be done as a means to that. Okay. So we've got a really big debate, distinct difference about the directive force of law. In the one case, we've got well-functioning law is operating through a force of reason. And the other uh, story is, is a story about ordinary causation opening uh, uh, where law engages at the point of the voluntary on the basis of passions. Um, there's a fundamentally different conception of what legal authority is doing on the natural law side. Natural, natural law is, in a sense, teaching. What it's doing is it's engaging our capacity for rationality by directing our attention to various justifications um, and uh, 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 through that uh, getting us to be moved by those justifications. So uh, living in a community we might be, uh, 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 it might be important for us to uh, uh, go in for transport and movement about through space in an ordered fashion, very basic human need. So what the law of transport will do, for example, is uh, affirm to us the desirability of doing that in a cooperative manner, and then giving further indications about how we are to apply those justifications and move about space in an ordered and determinate manner. It's teaching us what to do in order to satisfy a common good, um, which is a good that on which all our interests depend, but which is going to specifically involve as a community uh, ordered motion through space, ordered transport, and lots of other things as well. Let me say a little more about why the state is needed. Um, it's needed because um, one picture the natural law thinkers don't accept is this that's a, a very modern picture. Again, I think it's in Hobbes, and it's this. The common good that we're all pursuing is one that we can all understand, so the modern view goes, as a sort of aggregation of all our individual interests. And 
uh, you know, from the very outset, we've got an idea of what, what it involves. It involves, if perhaps something a little less basic than Hobbes's survival, constructions on that, uh, our individual well-being, looked at together as an ag aggregate from a common law point of view. And we all understand this common good perfectly well. What we're using the state for is as a kind of tool to facilitate our getting to it. What the state isn't doing on this modern picture is informing of, uh, us of what the common good is, how it's constituted, what it involves as a value. Um, that's not the view of the natural law tradition. The natural law tradition supposes that prior to political institutions, we do not yet understand what the common good involves. Let's take something uh, like property. The natural law theorists, Aquinas and Suarez and the like, certainly think that as individuals, we've got a perfectly good understanding of what it is for us to own something. And we've got a perfectly good understanding of what might be involved in giving that piece of property up and giving it to somebody else, or giving it away to charity, or something like that. So we've got a, a, an understanding of what property involves from a private point of view, and we can make just perfectly sensible decisions about how to behave with it as a private citizen, not necessarily from a selfish point of view, but how to be altruistic with it as a private individual. What we don't immediately understand, just as individual human beings, is what property means and how it should be thought about from the point of view of a complete human community that includes lots of people with whom we have no private connection whatsoever. What, what, what kinds of property, rules of property should there be in general within a human community? Um, how should they work? Uh, uh, what, what, what should condition them? And their claim is that just as private individuals, we can't, we're not really good, very good at thinking about that. To think about property as, a com as part of the common good from the point of view of an entire human community, we need political institutions to do that. And notice they're not making this claim as a conceptual point. Um, in lots of ways, we shouldn't look at early modern and medieval natural law theory as what a lot of modern legal philosophy is, an exercise in conceptual analysis. Um, they think that it's just obvious that human beings work in a certain way, and they can only really think about the common good, the good of an entire community, including lots of people with whom they have no private connection, but with which at various levels they have eventually to cooperate. They can only think about this effectively and be motivated by it within political structures. So political structures make a genuinely public reason possible. They're a sort of amplification and, uh, 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 of our, our individual practical reason, without which we could in interact as part of a common society, a genuinely public realm. So we come back again to the thought that uh, um, the law is a kind of teacher. And it enables us to understand what the common good involves. Um, by the way, this isn't just an elitist idea. It's very, very natural to read all this. There's a, there's a sort of ruling elite that sort of teaches us what the common good involves. And us good subjects, we sit there and say, oh, gosh, I never thought of that. I better do what they say. That's not necessarily what it's about at all. Um, Suarez, for example, thought that the original form of the state was democracy uh, for reasons that are interesting and not necessarily terribly modern. But uh, obviously one way of conceiving of all this is to see political structures as ones in which everyone participates about and communally um, educate ourselves within these shared institutions into what the common good involves. So it needn't be elitist at all. Okay, um, what does the common good involve? Well, that's a massive question, but one of the things it involves is not just certain voluntary outcomes on the natural law tradition. <clears throat> It's not just about, so obviously very importantly does involve um, paying tax at a certain rate or parking your car in the wrong right, right place and, or, or avoiding murder and, kill, uh, and the theft and all that sort of thing. But it also importantly involves people sharing attitudes. And that, that goes with the thought that the function of this entire legal system is immediately to engage our rationality and to change what we believe and what we're motivated to do. So they think, for example, the function of, say, legislation to do with property is uh, not just to get us to refrain from theft, is to educate us into a genuine respect for and understanding of property rights. Um, 
so that we understand why it's so wrong to go and steal things from each other. Um, not just that, the function of all this law is to educate us into citizenship. So we start coming to share attitudes in which we respect each other as citizens with interests that respect, uh, deserve respect as well as our own. Um, and that's clearly very important to the well-being of the individual. If, for example, we realize that no one really cared damn about us, uh, and so far as they ever gave us benefits at the point of the voluntary, this was simply just to use us as some sort of instrument for their, their, their ends, we'd be rather devastated. Uh, a fundamental aspect of what it is to live in a happy society would be taken from us if we realize that's what it all, all was about. Uh, we, we would feel that to an important degree, uh, not, not perhaps unloved, but at any rate unrespected. And the state for this natural law tradition is about fostering attitudes, non-voluntary mental states in themselves, that not only produce certain forms of voluntary behavior, but also are fundamental to uh, 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 the happiness that each of us enjoys as part of a flourishing community. One area where this becomes important is, of course, in something like family structure. Here, I think something is continuous between the medieval and the early modern period and modernity. I think most states that I've ever heard of take a great deal of interest in family structure and strive to ensure that certain forms of family structure that it sees as fundamentally okay and permissible are genuinely respected within the culture. They're very, very unhappy with excessive public challenges to those accepted forms of family structure. And they're liable to cooperate with various parts of civil society to foster respect for those forms of family structure. Think of what it would have been like to go into a Victorian university in the United States or Britain and start preaching about alternative family structures in a very public forum. Think about what it is it would be like now and to start aggressively defending, even in an argumentative fashion, Victorian family structures as the only acceptable form of family structure in a modern university now. In both cases, you will find low, level, low levels of tolerance for the alternative, and that's a fact that's generally familiar to all of us. This is normal functioning for states and for civil institutions that are closely linked with the state. Uh, they will enforce a morality of family structure. What morality they enforce will change over time, but they will enforce it. In the early modern period, uh, as in the Middle Ages, states even directly tried to regulate belief. We're familiar with the general idea of heresy laws. Again, I think this is a very common phenomenon where certain forms of ethical belief become extreme or, or belief of ethical significance become a, a point of great concern for a political community. You will genuine, genuinely get, get attempts to pri privilege those forms of belief and to discuss, discourage public contradiction of them. The modern equivalent, obviously, or one modern equivalent of, of heresy laws are Holocaust denial laws, which can be found in a number of uh, European countries, particularly those in Central Europe uh, and surrounding districts, which had a certain unfortunate history in the mid 20th century. Uh, it's obvious what's going on. Certain forms of ethical disrespect are seen as particularly dangerous to the political community, and they're liable to be expressed. And when they're expressed, they will be penalised. This leads to a huge tension in modern liberalism, but it doesn't stop this sort of legislation getting passed and it gets through human rights, rights courts as well. Hobbes, of course, didn't like the regulation of belief. Not, I think, but because he was particularly liberal, but because of one last thing I'll say before I, I stop. Um, Hobbes, Hobbes was very opposed to the regulation of belief. Um, though he was very familiar with it. It was part of the canon law, uh, a state fact canon law of his opponents, Suarez and Bellamy. Why wasn't he happy with it? Well, <clears throat> he didn't have a substantive conception of a right to liberty. He didn't have a conception of a right to liberty that binds the state to obligate it. So that's a very famous feature of Hobbes's political theory. Uh, the right to liberty is what the state leaves you with the laws it's effectively passed. It's not bound to respect some right to liberty as something that obligates it to you. Um, what then would happen if, say, the Turkish Sultan uh, commanded you uh, as your ruler 
supposing he came to be such, to believe Islam. Well, the one thing that Hobbes can't say is, well, he can't do that because there's a right to liberty that he'd be violating. That's exactly what his, his uh, natural law opponents would have said. They believed in the right to liberty. Why did they believe in a substantive right to liberty and Hobbes not? Because they believed in another power that Hobbes didn't believe in. And it's equally important to their natural law theory. I've talked about the power of reason to move us, which Suarez and Aquinas believed in and Hobbes didn't. There's also the power we ourselves exercise to determine for ourselves what we do. The right to liberty is a substantive right for these natural law theorists because it's the normative uh, uh, respect given to that in the natural law. It's the right to determine for ourselves what we do. It's the recognition given to the power. But Hobbes didn't believe in the power. He didn't think we had a power to determine for ourselves what we do. He's a complete skeptic about freedom and will. And he has an extremely weak theory of the right to liberty. Whether, of course, modern political theorists who are equally skeptical about uh, rights, the powers of self-determination uh, deserve to be any less thin in their theory of the right to liberty than Hobbes was is, is another question. There I'll stop. Well, thank you, Tom. That was uh, fascinating. And uh, there are many, many things uh, to contemplate. And, 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 and I want to ask you far more questions than we have time. But uh, let me start with a few, uh, or at least one, <laughs> is uh, it, you talked about liberalism. And I, uh, I'll, pre I'll preface my question by saying uh, it would be great if you could say a little bit about what you mean by liberalism, since people think of it differently. And we have many people who uh, come from uh, countries and are listening in where, where the term might mean something different. But uh, it, in, in your parlance, is the liberal state a distinct type of state? Or are all states alike at some fundamental level? Well, I, 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 I think both. So let me say a little bit more. I think, look, all states are right, uh, similar at a fundamental level. I, I, I myself am inclined to think there's something importantly right about this natural law tradition. I think states are fundamentally are about informing us and educating us into a common good. And they're about establishing uh, a, an ethical community that has at its heart a consensus, the level of ethical beliefs and motivations. They're all about that. Um, not all states see themselves in those terms. They might well have an intellectual elite that has read Thomas Hobbes and subsequent writers and think that the state is simply a coordination and protection device uh, with perhaps a bit of added redistribution on top. Uh, uh, um, if we want to be a bit progressive, but that's basically what it's about. Um, that's what they think, if that's what they think all that states do, then they're wrong. If on the other hand, the modern liberal thinks that there's a really important right to liberty and it should be given a rather more respect than was given by Thomas Hobbes, um, then they, they, there might be a state that works in a way that respects that right to liberty more than other states do, more than Stalin's Russia or the Nazi state. Uh, or perhaps certain states in early modern Europe uh, that might have been favoured by Suarez and Bellamy. Uh, I don't necessarily wish to endorse all their views about what the limits to the right to liberty were. Um, so I think there are two levels you've got to look at this question. There's what, what's fundamentally are states about? And I think they are sort of fundamentally educative uh, devices that address us uh, uh, and depend on when they're functioning properly on something like the force of reason. But the force of reason needn't be opposed to respect for the light, right to liberty, which I think exists as part of what should be given rational recognition by any polity. Um, it, and, and so it, it's, if, if the state, if states are at fu some fundamental level the same, uh, you had talked about what the law directs, or, or how, uh, what, I'm sorry, the way the law directs uh, the citizenry. Could I add something to that? Is, is there a question then about how this, the state directs, the way it directs through law and to where it directs people? So a, a question of both method and ends in law. Yeah, it's, it's addressing our capacity for rationality. 
Now, I, I don't want to rule out that it can sometimes come just as a fairly brute command that's detached from any wider story, mm-hmm. and, 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 and in ways that make John Austin look, look really plausible. Uh, I don't deny that that can, go, that can happen, but that's a stage that you want to get on beyond, and, 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 and surely most of us want to, including, I think, many liberals. Um, to develop some understanding of why we should be obeying this law uh, uh, and what's the point of it. Um, and that's, of course, going to involve a story about justifications. Um, and at the end of, of this process of conforming to law will be the formation of a kind of ethical community. Now, we can think about this as an ethical community on this earth. Clearly, we're looking at this tradition as Hobbes was opposing it, uh, as a tradition being put forward by theologians who have a, a different view of where the end state is, one that they base on revelation. I might come back to some of the complications that arise to, but this natural structure doesn't require anything like that. Um, again, I, it, it's an interesting question whether it requires something like God. Um, uh, whether coercive authority goes beyond what, in, what human nature can possibly base is an interesting question. But if we bracket that, it could be fundamentally quite a this worldly story. And if it did involve God, certainly people like Suarez had a, an understanding of um, a world without revelation, which they thought was entirely possible, as a world that might have contained a form of religion at the level of state, but it had been an entirely natural religion, a religion of this life. What it would involve is a kind of ethical community in which we understand our flourishing as dependent on flourishing with other human beings as our co-citizens and respecting that fact. Um, I mean, so at at that level, um, we've got a framework that I think is quite attractive uh, because surely we all value that. it, we've also, I think, got a way of thinking about liberty, which I might come back to, because I think, I think the way they thought about the right to liberty was very importantly part of this uh, a, a kind of ethical progress, a story of an ethical progression that involved political institutions, very importantly. Uh, Professor Pink, I have a, I have a question. Uh, one of the words that uh, is, is popular in liberal polities is the term neutrality. Um, I think that your writing uh, is, is effective that asserting that that term neutrality is a bit hollow. Um, this might be straight stating your thoughts a little bit, but uh, put it in another way, can we do political philosophy without ethics? And, you know, and can we really be neutral? Right. Well, I suppose a lot, a lot of the neutrality vocabulary, it's often, often then turns into neutrality about the good. Um, and of course, where that comes from, I suppose, is Immanuel Kant, where of course it, it, it wasn't so much about uh, divorcing the political theory from the ethics, it was about reconstructing the ethics to do without a theory of the good. Uh, of course, that didn't work very well. And anyway, I'm not sure I'm one of those uh, people that thought Kant's ethical project actually works. I suppose nowadays what that becomes is an unassuming theory about goodness, because we clearly can't do, entirely do without that, rely on the categorical imperative on its own. Um, and then, and then, and then um, uh, try and do as much political theory on that very thin basis. That seems to be what's going on. And this framework story about the state being a coordinative device and uh, uh, sort of a bit of a protection agency with perhaps a bit of redistribution on top of them throw in the original position. Uh, that's, I suppose, the neutrality about the good. Well, I think my observations about, about, about the ethics of family structure uh, suggests that that's not a, a framework within which states are going to restrict themselves, or not any state that we actually know. Um, every state regulates and gives public recognition to some forms of union, not others, because of a view about what's an acceptable family structure, particularly for the bringing of bringing up of children. Um, but I mean, it's very significant, for example, the, the, the greater liberality in the loose sense of that term, uh, the modern state takes towards acceptable forms of union is also going to involve 
a greater liberality about acceptable ways of producing and bringing up children. So you, you know you want to have a surrogate market and 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 very liberalised forms of adoption and, and so on and so forth. But you've still got a determinate view of how uh, how fam how society should continue itself. That doesn't seem to me to be an area where it's being particularly neutral about the good. What it's certainly doing is it's giving a certain conception of autonomy, a, a greater role within family structures, and then it's going to enforce respect for that. And, and it's, it's, it's whatever it might have said about, uh, about not being quite coercive about that, it will in fact, as we see in a large number of countries, become increasingly coercive, as will further parts of civil society about that. Again, that's not neutrality about the good, it's about uh, shaping a very determinate ethical structure in a way to involve a certain very debatable and interesting ethics of autonomy as part of its, its composition. Um, so I think, I think um, what's going on is not an interesting form of neutrality about the good. I think it's, uh, it's a form of thinking about the good that involves a new way of thinking about liberty in, in a number of respects. The way, new way of thinking about liberty that, that is often picked up by using the word autonomy. Um, so I think the story is quite complicated, but I, I think a lot of a, a lot of this stuff about neutrality about good is just hand waving. I, I don't again. I don't. I'm not sure this is necessarily conceptual truth. I, I wouldn't want to go to the wall to say that you couldn't have a log, you know, conceptually possible human-like species where the state could function something like this framework way as a coordinatory and protective device. <clears throat> I think it's perfectly possible, um, it, but. You know, I, I don't think the natural law tradition is, is about conceptual examination. It's about how human beings fundamentally work and what's going to happen. I'll go one step further from Chris's question and I'll combine it with something you've been, you, you've been mentioning on the right to liberty. Uh, first part of my question is, can we do political theory or law without metaphysics? And the second part, uh, perhaps it's connected, perhaps it's not, is what, what is a natural law uh, right to liberty versus a, uh, the, the, the current modern conception of autonomy? Right, well, I, I mean, I don't think we can do without metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And I think there's the two, uh, these, these really key notions of rational direction which is closely tied to the idea of reasonableness. The reasonable person is the person who responds to rational direction, uh, to, to justifications. Um, uh, and again, it's so natural to think of the right to liberty as a right to determine for our, things for ourselves. And that immediately brings in the idea of capacity to determine things for ourselves, which is clearly a kind of power. Uh, it's clearly a very important power to determine what we do. So we've got at a very basic level in the way we, that we think about the political, um, even the political in the terms of, 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 of a lot of modern political liberalism, notions of, of, of right and of reasonableness that cry out, or clearly in the way we think about them in terms of common sense, uh, psychology and ethics, carry metaphysical baggage. Um, every moral philosopher who writes a book about how justifications or reasons move us Everyone in everyday life who talks about that was a really compelling argument. I feel driven to accept that conclusion. Um, it's a really desirable offer. I mean, I mean you know, I, I prefer not to want that. Um, you're, you're, you're thinking of yourself as exercising or being subject to various kinds of power that operate through mental faculties that are clearly not ordinary causation. Um, and you've got to take that seriously. Well, or you don't. One figure who didn't take it seriously, but who's a, I think a vastly more attractive political thinker than Hobbes, but again, is not a particularly fashionable one amongst uh, university liberals nowadays, is David Hume, who actually does have the project of doing political theory and ethics with a theory of normativity that doesn't have these powers of reason to move us or powers to determine things for ourselves. And one of the really interesting things to do is to look at the Humean ethical project and the political project, because he was a very great political thinker, and see whether it can possibly work. Because if something like that doesn't work, 
or it produces just nothing that we can find acceptable, then you've got a problem. You, you will back into the, 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 the vocabulary of rights to liberty uh, and uh, justifications moving us, and you'd better make sense of it with some degree of intellectual honesty rather than just be quietist about it. Um, and I think, I, think, I think that one of the, the really hard intellectual questions facing a lot of modern political theory is, is whether you can go on and on droning on about reasonableness as an important political value without taking what reason involves with any degree of metaphysical seriousness. I find that highly discreditable myself. And it's going to make all sorts of problems for you down the line. How are you going to distinguish between treating someone uh, uh, as a rational human being and seriously addressing their capacity for rationality and just manipulating them if you don't take what the capacity for rationality involves seriously and what it is for a justification to be moving you as opposed to something else parading as such without being the same thing at all. So um, now the right to liberty. I, 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 I mean, I was always brought up as, as in modern philosophy on, on old Isaiah Berlin, you know, the two, the two concepts of liberty stuff, the negative one and the positive one. And it's, 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 all a, it's all quite clever, but it's a bit tired because what, what's really going on are the, the shadows, I think, of a really interesting conception of what liberty means within the ethical and within the political, that is, is actually destroyed by, amongst other people, Hobbes. You start off with the power of self-determination. You know, we have this capacity to determine for ourselves what we decide and do. We all think we've got it. Um, and if someone starts telling us what to do, we will say, look, don't you tell me what to do. Uh, it's up to me what I do. So we assert the power as basing a right not to be subjected to coercive pressure. And then we've got the right. The right not to be coerced. And it's a right to exercise this power. And at the far end, we've got something else that's really important. And, and clearly this right not to be cursed is, is, is very closely associated with sort of ways of thinking about liberty negatively in other Berlinian terms. And at the very end, we've got a desirable state or condition, what we might call the state of liberation, <clears throat> which again, everyone, everyone kind of understands. You get it within a religious framework in the New Testament. Christ is a form of liberation, but we get it in secular forms and various forms of cultural liberation. It's not a right, it's not a power to, to take decisions, but it's a desirable way of being. And the way that this natural law tradition thinks about it, as you, I think, is that you start off with the power. The power has a function to take you to the good by providing you with alternatives. So it's quite a, already a metaphysically complicated story about what it involves, to do with free will as a power over alternatives. Then the coercer comes along, and what the coercer does is threaten you with nasty outcomes unless you do one particular thing. So they're taking away all the alternatives by one option, by way of the good, by making everything else worse. Um, and that stands in need of justification because they're getting in the way of this power with its function of giving you alternatives by way of the good by making lots of things bad, except what they want you to do. Um, and so you need to justify coercion and you need an authority story and a story about why the authority is serving your interests and other people as well. And that final story is going to be a story I think ultimately about, as it was, I think about a form of liberation that's going to involve uh, uh, an ethical community. Now Hobbes destroys that story by get, getting rid of the power, power in the first place. And as I say, you, you get shat. I mean, clearly the state of liberation has aspects of positive liberty in it. The, the right has aspects of negative liberty in it. And, uh, uh, and where you started off, what unites them as part of this story of ethical progression is the power and its function. And Hobbes is removing that. He's removing the, the, the functional conception of the power. In fact, he's removing the power. Um, and you, you, just, you just have this, this, this brute activity of coercion at the point of the voluntary that's supposed to enable you to survive. And then you've got to reconstruct the right to liberty somehow after all that. And I suppose what the theory of autonomy very briefly put is, is an abandonment of this story of ethical progression, at any rate on the surface, and a transforming of liberty from being successfully a power, a right, and, uh, and a desirable condition to being some sort of value associated with choice. Whereas a value that just sits there 
to do associated with uncoerced choice without any other story, it seems, about what we should be choosing things for uh, or, or why some outcomes might be better than others. Um, so it's a sort of, sort of arbitrary value that uh, can be shoved in the face of anyone who tries to tell you what to do um, and will be shoved in their face unless, of course, uh, what they're trying to get, tell you what to do is a way of preventing really nasty things like murder and the like. And that's just not a very satisfying way of thinking about liberty. It's going to lead, I think, to an awful lot of, 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 of conflict uh, because my, my arbitrary autonomy is going to compete with yours. And it's going to lead to um, irresoluble debates. There's only going to be no way of resolving the debates uh, uh, between these conflicting visions about what my autonomy should allow me to do uh, beyond the very basic. Uh, and so we see it in, in contemporary culture. So I, I, I think what we're looking at on the one hand is, is a right that's embodied in a theory of uh, distinctive metaphysical capacities and powers uh, that have an end state. And on the other hand, we've got a disconnected value, which again comes originally from Kant, but it, it has lost even its Kantian backup, really. Professor, I have a, I have a question uh, about the concept of reason. Um, is reason an act or is reason a thing to the extent that immaterial things can be a thing? Uh, or is it, you know, something else? Uh, and then also related, relatedly, what are the limits of reason? Uh, especially when you are uh, confronted with someone who is impeded in some way from reasoning. Right, well, that's, that, that's, uh, that's sort of question, answering which makes you start having sympathy with Hobbes, of course. This is a really difficult question to answer in this sense. Look, look what's going on. We're talking about, you know, objects of belief. They might not be empirical ones. They might be to do with a mathematical claim, for example, on the one hand, or outcomes that haven't yet happened. They're just objects of my thought, potential goals, like buying that house or going for that sort of career. And I entertain them. They're just objects of my thought. I entertain them in my mind's eye. And somehow they come with this normative property that guides me into whether I believe some of them or disbelieve them, whether I decide on some of them or avoid deciding on them. And this raises a huge number of questions. It, they, they raise questions about the nature of the power. What is this power that moves me to form beliefs or moves me to take decision, attracts me to deciding on desirable or good outcomes as ones I would pursue, for example. What is this power? And what immediately bears it? It looks as though, um, what's immediately bearing them are mental objects, potential objects of belief, like mathematical claims or uh, un as yet unrealized goals. And this is a massive problem in late scholastic metaphysics. There's a huge part of Suarez's metaphysical disputations in the discussion of the Aristotelian causes, in which he tries to locate this power of reason <clears throat> within the wider theory of nature. And it's that that Hobbes doesn't believe. Um, it's clearly, I think, the mental objects are a trouble, and so, so is the power. And, and, and this leads to the sorts of debates uh, with an early modern philosophy that take you in one direction to Kant, who's clearly not wanting us to be motivated by objects of thoughts, ends, that would be heteronomy. Um, and then on the other hand, it's taking us to someone like Hume, who doesn't believe in practical reason or something that moves us at all. Um, so we've got a really big problem here. How can our power move us, as they used to call it in, 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 in scholastic natural books, intentionality, intentionally through objects of thought. But again, if that doesn't exist, we can't make sense of it, then we should talk, I think, give up talk, talk of reasons moving us, justifications moving us. Uh, we, should, we should describe what's going on in completely different ordinary causal terms of that. Um, that's the question you're raising, I think. But there's a further add-on to your question, which makes it even harder. Uh, what we've, we've been talking about states addressing us from the force of reason. What are we going to talk, how are we going to talk about states that are bad and dodgy states uh, to a fairly significant degree? You know, Nazi states or Stalinist states or uh, modern liberal states, if, if they are nasty. I'm going to be neutral about that um, to a degree. Um, what, what they do, let's just ex hypothesize they're not presenting justifications 
they're parading things as justifications that aren't really justifications because they're getting us to do nasty things um, out of a false citizenship. Well, how do we really describe what they're doing? What, what's this force that's operating on us? It's not the force of reason, but it seems to engage our rationality because they can lead us astray, but they can't lead my dog astray. My dog doesn't understand what, what the, the, the Nazi state's about at all uh, or the Stalinist state, but we do. We can be seduced through our rationality. And one of the very interesting problems in, in again, early modern uh, normative theory is how you describe irrationality. How does your capacity for rationality be moved by other than a justification so that you respond as someone rational but misled, as someone to a degree irrational, but through a misguided capacity for rationality? Um, and you've got a, a really nasty choice. On the one hand, you've got someone like Thomas Hobbes who says, no, it's just causation. Um, and that doesn't make sense of all the argument and being moved by reason. And on the other hand, you've got some really quite strained attempts to explain how the force, a genuine force of goodness could attract us into irrationality because they want to say that somehow it's a misformation of our capacity for rationality that's going on in the tyrannical state. We are being misattracted by goodness, genuine goodness, but in a, in, in a misguided way. Um, and, and, and a lot of adaptations of, of, of theories of, of the good as partial. Uh, uh, so whatever, however bad the option that the tyrannical state is pointing you towards, there's something good about it and that's doing some work, will of course be part of what they're, they're, they're adopting as, 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 as their get out strategy. But I don't think anyone's got an answer to all these problems. I think one of the reasons no one's got an answer to these problems is no one does any work on the metaphysics of reason nowadays. You get books on the metaphysics of free will, but not on the metaphysics of reason, not really. Modern Kantianism, uh, within, particularly within North American academia, is famous in, in ethical theory. It's famously pretty metaphysics free, or, or very well known people. They'll talk about identity and, and practical identity and stuff like that, but they won't talk about the power of reason to move us in any metaphysically developed way, not even to the extent that the Kantian tradition would allow you to. And that, of course, is, is a massive unsolved problem. Your phrase, parading justifications, I think is a, a very interesting one. Is it the case, would you say, that in uh, some modern liberal states that uh, liberality is a, a mirage in some sense, that as uh, is, is, uh, as you described it, uh, trying to find, uh, putting justifications to it, even if uh, the state or polity is trying to say that it's not enforcing morality with X law or Y law, in the end it is because the, the, the political authority has some conception of what's right or wrong, even if they are uh, trying to uh, in, uh, trying to get people to accept that through a notion of neutrality and, and, and so forth. Um, so, so is there, is this a case of, of, of of presenting a mirage sometimes in order to get people to to support the state or a particular state? I think a degree of that happens. But I think I don't again, I don't think it's particularly new. So take take culture war, argy bargy of the sort we're all familiar with. Take your on the one hand you have your cultural conservative, on the other hand you have your cultural liberal. And each is completely blind the existence at various points in history of fairly substantive state pressure in support of their own cause. So you'll get a certain sort of uh, uh, social conservative who thinks of themselves as a political liberal, who's utterly oblivious to the degree of trouble you'd have got into uh, uh, not so long ago if you'd started trying to teach gay marriage courses in, in, in a Western European university. I mean, you know, how you'd have been in real trouble, and the, you know the the, the 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 donors and their friends in the government would have been crying blue murder. Um, but again, you'll get people who are social liberals who are completely blind to what are clearly genuine kinds of coercion uh, in the other direction happening now. 
I remember once uh, talking to the head of a fairly well-known and major British university, uh, not the head of the whole thing, but the Dean of Arts, and I said, could you teach an argued course on family structure that developed some, uh, defended something like a 19th century, pre, pre-20th century natural law uh, morality of marriage uh, as the right one? And um, he said, you have a dream, he said, oh no, we'd have to shut you down. Uh, of course, we knew he was absolutely right, that's exactly what would happen. But there's an awful lot of great dishonesty on both sides about, about this ever-changing reality. The one thing that goes right through it, and I ram home the point again because it's so obviously true, is that every stage, the state and associated groups within civil institutions within civil society enforced a certain morality of the family within the Gothic sphere. They very, very deliberately did so. What they might do is, is in certain contexts where they see themselves as liberals, do it informally. We will withdraw your grant. Well, we won't be renewing your contract, Professor X, rather than you'll be, you'll be imprisoned. But they will be using the directive system of the state in a certain direct and associated entities in a certain direction. And that's normal function. And to the extent that people don't aren't honest about this, and honest about the fact that this is partly because we require stability of family structure to flourish as, as, as a race, it's, it's really fundamental. Uh, and so the state will play its role in that. If we're not honest about that, we can't be honest about what states do. <clears throat> And we won't, we won't be hearing other people when they might have legitimate observations about what has been done to them. I have one more question and then uh, Chris can ask uh, some of the questions that have been queuing in the, in the box. Uh, I, I think your last point is, is very important to what I take as your thesis. And that is that no matter how the political authority describes what they're doing, a state is going to do what a state is going to do. Uh, so the political authority might deny that it is, uh, in a very Hobbesian way, deny that it's appealing to reason. Um, and, and perhaps, to your example, there are states that act more like that. They're, they're more forceful. The, 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 uh, the direction of the, of the law is heavy on penalties. And in, and in, uh, in a legal context, we see this in, in many strict liability laws uh, where uh, there isn't a question of why, why, you why you did it, what happened, but there's just a penalty if X happens. Um, and there might be situations where it's needed, where the state needs in emergencies, many situations we can see where the force of the state is needed, uh, but a, a more superior form of, of, of the law, it, it would be that it is appealing to reason. Uh, it, it may be backed with the force of the state, but that if the conditions arise, that the, uh, that the law is structured in a way, as you noted, as a teacher to form us uh, last week, as discussion comes to mind, also to form us in friendship and civic friendship. So, so, so I, I suppose my, uh, my, my wrap up question uh, for you uh, is if, if a state is going to do what a state is going to do, no matter what the political authorities say, uh, is, is it simply best for us to acknowledge that and the so-called liberal states also to acknowledge that it is doing a type of morality and get down to debating first things and fundamental things uh, and calling it like it is that all parties uh, are trying to do ethics, trying to do morality uh, using the state. And, and, and we really need to debate the fundamental points. Yeah, I think I entirely agree with that, really, fundamentally. Um, uh, I think that clearly, clearly, um, we ought to treat each other uh, as adults and, and be realistic about what's at stake is another way of putting that. Um, and I think, I think one thing we've got to be realistic about, uh, there's a great tendency in our culture, uh, I know some very able legal philosophers who, who make what I think is a mistake, which is to see teaching as one thing and argument as one thing and punishment is completely different. 
but we are imperfect beings by any account. And one of the functions of punishment is not to provide an alternative to teaching, to go back to Chris's point about how we deal with the rationality. It's a way of communicating justifications to the less than perfectly rational, but it's definitely deeply involved in argumentative communication. Um, and the late Joel Feinberg's expressed this theory of punishment was bang on the nail on that one, I think, where the function of sanctions is to express a view of why they're being imposed. So when the judge sends you down for five years for theft, he will say, I'm doing this to you, Fred, to communicate to you how serious a wrong you've committed. Um, and if he didn't send you down for five years and just gave you a light tap, the person stung from would be really offended because there would be an implicit message that nothing seriously wrong had been done. So that this coercive bit is part of the rational communication bit. It'd be, it'd be glad, wonderful if it weren't necessary, but it's not completely detached from the rational communication. And we're, uh, we're a little bit over the hour mark, but I do wanna ask just one quick question from the chat box uh, and then we'll, we'll close. Uh, how does a liberal theory of the state accommodate other cultures? Well, um, that's, I think, a bigger question, which I'm not sure that modern liberal theory is terribly good at answering. It's a, a big feature of early modern states who we see as uniform and sort of tyrannical things in our Ladybird Book of History. They were, they, they were very complex communities. They had lots of cultures living in them. You go to the early modern Republic of Poland or uh, uh, large areas of Germany, you had very mixed populations, including what was of greater significance then perhaps than it would be now, mixed religions. And so they actually had to think about how you run a state where there is serious disagreement about how we ought to live in ways that clearly have relevance for the common good. But where they are honest about the fact that a particular view of the common good is going to have to win. What are you going to do about the losers? And the one thing they actually don't do on the whole, not as a rule, I mean, we, we read in the history books about the times when they get to this state, but one thing they tend not to do immediately is drive people out or just shut them down. Um, so apart from anything else, it's extremely difficult and expensive thing to do. You, you're having to use, if you're an early modern ruler, uh, uh, a significant portion of your finances to attack your own tax base, uh, which is why a lot of Habsburg rulers in Central Europe aren't very keen on going for Protestants, much to the annoyance of the then popes, uh, until it gets really dangerous in around 1618. Um, so they are actually very interested in this question of how you have multicultural societies, and the Ottomans are very interested in it as well. Um, and they, 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 they have theories of someone's going to have, we can't be, the state can't be neutral, someone's going to then lose out. Some groups are going to lose out. Their view is not going to actually be accommodated overall, but they've got to be allowed to prosper because there are ethical values at stake, including a right to liberty, which have to be respected. Within our ethical community, we do have to recognize that some people, however mistaken might might be, have to be allowed to run a community their own way. And I think actually one of the things we need to do is to go back to the way they thought about that. Because what we tend to get in our culture at the moment is if you share, fail to share, the increasingly dominant <clears throat> view of common good parading possibly as something else, your, your nasty and man have to be shut down immediately. You have to be cancelled. And immediately a, a, a soft but extremely uncompromising version of the extermination program is wheeled on. The one thing you won't have done to you is be communicated with in a public sphere and, and be given right to run a community your own way. You will be cancelled. And that is, is not a possible way of running a community. Um, and while you try to do that, it will lead to uh, appalling and rather nasty forms of social tension. Um, with, with nasty forms of reaction, you may get some political leaders being 
uh, supported by the people you oppose, you don't like very much. And then they get elected sometimes, which wouldn't have happened if you'd been a little more reasonable in the way you dealt with them. Um, and, uh, I can think of some, some rather good US journalists who made observations on this point <coughs> in the New York Times, uh, 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 and they're quite right. Um, so um, how you do it is going to be a balancing act. It's going to be a balance between respect for a common good that you think you're right about, and you may well be right about it, and respect for people's right to be mistaken to a degree, and to lead a communal life that may be to some degree self-contained. So I think, I think there is a natural law tradition way into a form of multiculturalism that's controlled by it, and it's a very old one. You will get it in, 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 in late medieval canon law, actually, in relation to the treatment of the Jews and the Muslims. Uh, um, now, obviously, we're not going to apply anything quite like that because we're, we've, we've got different forms of community and we're going to be probably dealing with a different view of the common good uh, as the dominant one. Um, but there are lessons there. Uh, uh, which over simple views of, of, of the medieval and early modern period, I think, obscure from us. Uh, Professor Pink, I think your last point, which is a wonderful one to, to end on, is uh, we, we could have a whole program on, on that uh, in, in looking at history on how to deal with multiculturalism. I, I think that there is a tendency to think that uh, this, is a, this is a modern problem. And uh, when this, this is the history of, of humanity <laughs> issue. And, and uh, we can look to history for models. I, that, that's, that's certainly something in discourse that uh, at least to me, it seems uh, sorely lacking. But uh, thank you for staying on a few minutes longer. I appreciate this. This has been a great conversation. And thank you also for being one of our advisors for the Common Good Project. It's been a delight having you on our advisory board. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.